Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Christ is risen. Indeed, he is risen. In this morning's reading from the first letter of Peter, uh, we are reminded that we are strangers and pilgrims in this world. This kind of runs contrary to something that Paul says in his letter to the Ephesians, where he says, you are no longer strangers and pilgrims, but you are fellow citizens with the saints. We are strangers and pilgrims when it comes to our relationship with the world. <laughs> if you hadn't figured it out. We are aliens in a strange land. A stranger perhaps today than it has been for a long, long time. In relationship to the church, we are no longer strangers and foreigners. We have come to a place where we know who we are, and we have a sense of belonging, of being part of the body of Christ in this community in Park City, Kansas, the Church of God in Park City. Seraphim Rose, who has been declared a saint by the Church of Georgia, not the state of Georgia, the country. He says, our home is in heaven. Please remember that we were created for heaven. Our whole life is just a continuous wandering on the way home. So we, as Christians, are strangers to the world that we live in, and we are citizens with the saints in our relationship to the Church of Christ, to the body of Christ. How do we live that out? That, in other words, how do we live a resurrection life as a community. I think a major resource for us in the western rite of the Antiochian Archdiocese is the rule of Saint Benedict. You know, in the west uh, we have uh, the order of Saint Benedict. This is the monastic tradition of the West. Now, within Western Christianity, within the Latin Church, they multiply their monastic traditions. So there's Carmelites and uh, Carthusians and, big pardon? Jesuits. Jesuits. Is this all kinds, all kinds of, all kinds of monastic traditions. But in classic. Western Orthodox Christianity, there is only one type of monasticism, and it is Benedictine monasticism. Just as in the East, there is only one tradition of, of monasticism. Uh, it doesn't matter whether the, whether the monastery is in Romania or Kosovo or uh, Africa or Russia or Finland, wherever it is, it's Basilian monasticism, following the rule of St. Basil the Great, which was the basis of Benedict's monastic rule for the, for the Western Church. In Benedictinism, the person who becomes a member of a Benedictine monastic community uh, makes a commitment to three vows and I would suggest that these three vows would be good things to require any 
a person who desires to become a member of our community or of any Christian community uh, within the Orthodox Church. The first one is stability. You commit yourself to stability. In other words, you really throw your lot with this community. This is your community. This is the womb from which you were born into the one holy Catholic and apostolic Orthodox Church. And uh, I remember in, the, in my final days in my former life, uh, the big thing was that the danger to Christianity is parochialism. That is, uh, the, it was perceived that the danger was really taking seriously one's relationship to one's parish. And they started saying that really we ought to, we, we, we're not members of just a parish, we're members of the diocese, whatever that is. Each and every one of you are members of this community. This is the body of Christ in Park City, Kansas. And I want to caution you. Uh, if you really are committed to this community, and you acknowledge that this is the place through which you came into the faith of the Orthodox Church, that then it makes no sense to wake up on a Sunday morning and just say, I just, I think I'm going to go to St. Mary's today. St. Mary's isn't your church. It is not your community. St. Michael's is your community. Now, if your brother-in-law goes to St. Mary's and they have a baby and the baby's being baptized this morning, then you ask for a blessing from your pastor. I want to absent myself from St. Michael's this morning to go to St. Mary's because my nephew is going to be baptized. And I'm not a mean person, and I'm going to give you a blessing to do that. But if we commit ourselves to this community, that this is where we're going to work out our salvation in fear and trembling, then this is where you do it. It's not going to happen if you just flit around. It's here that, that you have made a commitment to work out your salvation. The second thing that Benedict uh, had the monks or nuns who became part of the Benedictine community uh, to commit themselves to is fidelity to our way of life. Fidelity to our way of life. Now what are some of the things that, that comprise our way of life in this community that are different from the way of life of another community. Well, the first thing is liturgy. Our liturgy is different than the liturgy of the other Orthodox churches in this town. And I, I reject, and I have, I, have, I have academic credentials that give me the authority to reject, the notion that the only way that the Orthodox faith can be conveyed to you is through the Byzantine liturgy. That is not true. That is a misunderstanding of the church. The church has never had one universal liturgy, never. Every particular culture had its own expression of worship. They were all the same, they were just different because we're different. 
than someone, some other community. If you want to deepen your spiritual life in terms of involvement in the liturgy, then learn about our liturgy. Immerse yourself in our liturgy. Acknowledge the fact that our liturgy goes back to, the, to earlier than the 6th century. It is based on the oldest liturgy in Christendom, the liturgy of St. Peter, which is the basis of the liturgy of St. Gregory, which is what we use to worship. And I also want to take issue with anybody that suggests that somehow we're less than because we use this liturgy and everybody else is using the other liturgy. This saint right here, St. John Maximovich, you know what he said, never, never, never let anybody tell you that you have to be Eastern in order to be Orthodox. So I don't want anybody to tell me that the only way that you can deepen your spiritual life is to deepen it through the Byzantine liturgy. Because this church doesn't just have the Byzantine liturgy, it also has the ancient and venerable liturgy of St. Gregory the Great. We fast different than other people. In fact, the others aren't even fasting, for heaven's sake. They're just abstaining. They, they're not eating a certain amount of stuff, but they're eating a lot. Go to one of their potluck suppers. They're eating a lot of food. They're not fasting. They're abstaining. We actually fast. Because our tradition tells us that not only do we abstain from eating meat and meat products, but we also are supposed to cut back and eat less when we're fasting. That's our tradition. And it's every bit as valid as the, others, the other people's tradition. We sing hymns. We sing hymns. That's part of our tradition. That's part of the, the Western liturgical tradition, hymns. We have musical instruments. We have an organist and we have an organ. We do some things <clears throat> a cappella. We have a hymnal. It has some wonderful hymns. Uh, in fact, the St. Ambrose hymnal is the finest hymnal I've ever seen of any religious group, Christian group. It's, a, it's, it's an awesome hymnal. It has, it has a treasury of ancient hymns. As well, it has some other hymns that come from other periods in church history that speak to us. So fidelity to our way of life is important. And I'm going to be so bold as to tell you that I think we can be proud of our way of life. And I don't want anyone to disparage it. The third thing, the third vow that a person makes in the Benedictine tradition is obedience. One day I was having coffee with Bishop Basil. We were talking about the difference as, as, as an Episcopal priest at that time, the difference between the Episcopal Church and Orthodoxy. Uh, you could talk a long time about that. <laughs> but we got down to talking about what do you promise when you become a, an Episcopal priest? You know? And I remember I, I knelt at, at, 
over the stone that was over the crypt of Samuel Seabury, the first Anglican Bishop of America. I mean, that has to count for something, you know? It's pretty remarkable. He was down there, Samuel Seabury. And I knelt before a desk and I signed a document that said I was going to follow the doctrine, discipline, and worship of this church and that I was going to obey my bishop. And Bishop Basil laughed and said, you're never going to be told to obey your bishop. You're going to obey the canons of the church, which you are required to keep as well as your bishop. So if the bishop asks me to do something that is in accordance with the canons of the church, I have an obligation to obey it. But if he asks me to do something that is contrary to the teaching of the church and the canons of the church, I have an obligation to say, wait a minute, I, I'm not going to do that. So I had no problem. I had no problem saying, yes, Master, whenever he told me to do something, because I know that he faithfully committed himself to being a loyal son of the church. So we need to be obedient to Holy Scripture. We need to be obedient to the canons of the church. We need to be obedient to the customs and the way of life that we have embraced in this community. That's part of being an orthodox Christian. Orthodoxy isn't a do your own thing religion. And when we commit ourselves to these three things, to really throw our lot with the community that gave birth to us, and to have fidelity to our way of life, and to be obedient to, these, to the standards that are presented to us through Holy Scripture and the tradition of the church, when we do these things, we can effectively we can effectively live a resurrection life. We can be an example to those outside the church that our life together as a community is healthy and life-giving. So I don't know about you, but when I look at the world around me today, I have no problems in saying I am a stranger and a pilgrim and an alien because we're going down we're going down a trail I'm not willing to go down but I also know <clears throat> that when I when I come to this place when I share in worship together with you my brothers and sisters in Christ, that I do not feel like a stranger. I do not feel like an alien. I feel that I have come home. So to reiterate the quote from Seraphim, St. Seraphim Rose, our home is in heaven. That's where I'm heading. I may go down some alleyways, but I'm going to do everything in my power to get back on the main road that leads, and it's narrow. It's a very narrow road. Please remember that we were created for heaven. We're not just bodies, you know. We are spiritual beings. We're spiritual beings. We were made for union with God. Our whole life is just a continuous wandering. This isn't my, this isn't my world. 
I, I yearn for paradise. And I commit myself to journey with each of you as we make our way home. Jesus said to his disciples, let not your heart be troubled. Believe in me and believe, believe in God and believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. I'm not heading towards some fantasy. I'm not heading towards some unattainable utopia. I'm, I'm heading towards a place that's prepared for me by the one who gave his life for me. And I rejoice that you are on the way with me.